Well, as you stand in the middle of life's highway this morning and you look ahead, you look down the road in front of you into 2022, how do you feel? Perhaps like many, your tendency actually is to look in the rear view mirror and it's to see all the bumps of last year. And looking back, the, the 2021 rear view may appear quite bleak to you. But what if 2022 is a repeat? For many, the last two years have been shockers. There have been numerous hard-working Aussies who have now lost their businesses. Confidence in the government has been shaken. For many people, there, I believe, is a, a great sense that we've lost much. For others, there's growing anxiety and even anger. Most, I suspect, feel unsure of what is ahead. And lots just feel exhausted. The rear view can, for others, show up if you think of the image of the road, it can show up just all the potholes. That's what your eye goes to. There's other good things, but you just look at the potholes as you look in the rear view mirror. You see the numerous collisions that have happened between people. The injuries that that has caused, the, the hurt that some still feel. Not a few look ahead down 2022 road and they find themselves in great uncertainty with, un with unemployment or employment, what will it be? You see, friends, in such a season, it is so easy to become nervous and especially easy to become self-focused. The Apostle John in Revelation chapter 1, was facing great uncertainty as he sat on an island. John had already been through a lot. We could argue he had lost his job. And now he found himself in imposed isolation on Patmos. Would life return to normal for him? Ever again? And what about the churches? You see, persecution was on the rise. This was a very uncertain time for Christians. And then, then the Lord drew near. God had something to say to John. The book starts, doesn't it, if you have it there, in Revelation chapter 1, it starts by describing what it's all about. Chapter 1, verse 1, says, The revelation of Jesus Christ. The word revelation means unveiling. The pulling back of the curtain. The unveiling. John needed this. And so did the churches, the unveiling of the then glorified Christ. So it's not just for John. Verse 4 of chapter 1 says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia. Some of the churches were beginning to lose their way. And they needed to listen. John himself needed his eyes to be off himself. And so Revelation contains a, a glorious vision of the glorified Son of Man. And in this, in this vision, God, I believe, has something to say, not just to John, not just to those seven churches in Asia, but he has something to say to us. 
I would like to spend, God willing, the next few Lord's Days opening up the vision of the glorified Son of Man. This morning we're going to tackle two very simple things. We're going to look firstly at the plight and then secondly at the sight. We won't look at all that John sees, but we will begin to see what it is that's put in front of him. So firstly then, as we come into Revelation chapter 1, let's think about the plight. John outlines for us his personal circumstances in verse 9, where he says, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. John tells us where he is. He is on a rocky Mediterranean island called Patmos. It was called Patmos and I believe it still is called Patmos. That island is four kilometres wide roughly. It's about 12 kilometres long. It's about 50 k's southwest across the water of Ephesus. Ephesus is the town, we generally understand, where, where John had actually come from. And when he is eventually released from his persecution, it's generally understood that's where he goes back to. And though it was that Patmos was a Mediterranean island, and it is apparently a favourite holiday destination, even for tourists today, back in the first century, Patmos was far from a resort island. It was John's rugged prison island. We've got to understand John is not there on a summer holiday. He's been placed there by the Roman authorities. Why? Well, he t he's told us that in verse 9. We read it before. He says, I was on the island that is called Patmos for this reason. For the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. John was the last surviving apostle. He had been a prominent and influential leader in the church, it would seem by this stage, for decades. And the Romans wanted to remove his preaching of the word of God. They wanted to remove the testimony influence of this man. And so how do you do that? Well, in this case, you just simply remove him. Problem solved. John had been dropped down, we might say, on a desert island and at this point simply left there to rot. Now perhaps the Roman authorities simply were wanting to make him an example, or an example of him to the other Christians. You pursue what John does and this is what will happen with you. You'll be cut off from your family. You can see there in verse 9 that John identifies himself with these other brethren. He identifies himself with those who are going to read this epistle. In verse 9, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Now, he could have pulled out the card and said, I'm an apostle. But he didn't. He says, I'm your brother. I'm a partner with you in tribulation that we are all enduring as Christians at the moment. He said, brothers and sisters, I am in this with you. Don't you remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. I think it's pretty certain for me to say that we would much prefer, wouldn't we, a Christian life to be something like a stress-free holiday on a Greek island? But that is not Jesus' promise. And neither was it the current experience of John and the early Christians. And neither has it been the Christians ever since. And so why should we expect it to be any different in our day or our country? And so here is John's plight and the plight of the local churches that John was writing to. Times were difficult. 
And so coming back to the analogy of the road, we could argue that the future road ahead for John and these brethren did look very uncertain. And it, and it certainly would have given the impression that it looked like everything was out of control. Now remember, this is the Apostle John who years earlier had laid his head on Jesus' breast. This is the man who had been so close in his affection with the Lord Jesus. And, and surely the question might have been asked, but where is the Son of Man now? He was so loving to me before. Where is he now? I think we could easily imagine that John, in, in, in light of this whole set of circumstance and in this place of isolation, that all of this could have built up into his, in his mind and, and become quite overwhelming. And, and, and I think we could even argue that on this particular day, when he has this experience and he writes this, it, it appears, or he writes about this, you could imagine that he could have been depressed. On this day, what day is it? Again, he tells us in verse 9, doesn't he? He tells us where he was, at verse 10 rather, he tells us when it was. He says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. On the Lord's Day. This is the Lord's Day. This is the day that the church was gathering for worship and fellowship back home in Ephesus but here I am, and I'm cut off from them. I can see him in my imagination. I can see him standing there somewhere on the rocky shores or on a cliff face somewhere, looking out across the ocean, looking out across the surf, looking northeast toward home. He's in forced isolation. He's under persecution. Many of the churches are really struggling. What can be done? Well, God comes, doesn't He? God meets with him on this day. God refreshes him on the Lord's day. And so, as verse 10 says, it's the Lord's day, but it also uses this phrase that He's in the Spirit. I would suggest that related to that is the idea that he is fellowshipping with the Lord by the Spirit on this day. He's meditating on the things of God on this day of worship, the first day of the week. It's a precious day for the new covenant people of God. This is the day every week as we are today. We remember, we celebrate that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. It's the first day of the week that the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost. The Lord's Day, it is a day of rest and it's a day of refreshment. It's like an oasis in the desert, the barren desert of this world. That's what it is for God's people. The Lord's Day is designed, you see, to refresh our souls. And by the Spirit, it can be that to us, even amidst seasons of barrenness and places of barrenness. So here's John. He's on this Greek island in isolation in the Spirit, and the Lord visits him from behind. See verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a voice as of a trumpet. Now before John turns around to see who is this one with this loud voice that's piercing like a trumpet, with such clarity, before he turns to see him, the one behind him who's speaking identifies himself. Verse 11, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, John, write, it, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. John, I'm about to show you something. And what you are about to see, I want you 
to write that down and I want you to put it in a letter and I want you to send it off to these churches. Yes, even to your beloved Ephesus and all your sister churches, you and they too need to see this. And brethren, the vision that John describes is what we need to see as well. As we look down the road of 2022, maybe some of you are feeling a little uncertain. Maybe there are circumstances in your lives that are not even related to COVID and those issues. But there are other circumstances in your lives at the moment. And as you look down 2022 road, it can almost be overwhelming. Well, I believe it's this vision that we all need. Whatever we may perceive is down our road. I believe it's this vision that, that local churches even desperately need today. We as a church need this vision. I heard of another church this week, a faithful church, a faithful brother in the ministry, actually a man who was once preached for us. This is in Australia. And they've decided to close. The demands, the pressures became too much. John was no doubt feeling the pressure. And, and many of their churches were struggling. And they needed to see the glorified Son of Man. And so do we. And so I pray God's Spirit opens our eyes in a fresh way if we're God's people to see who Christ is. For those who are not God's people, to open your eyes for the first time to see the magnificence of Jesus Christ. And so there's the first thing, the plight. Now let's move into this second, and this is the heart of the study that God willing will spend to the rest of our time today in the coming couple of weeks in the sight. Now look at verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment, down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. And now, as John turns around, he sees two things. He sees the golden lampstands and he sees the glorified Lord. They're the two things. In verse 12, you'll see how he expresses this. He says in the second half, And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. The golden lampstands. Now what is this? Well, we haven't got to come up with our own ideas. We haven't, we haven't got to invent our own interpretation. Jesus tells us, at the end of the chapter, at the end of verse 20, right at the end, he says, the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. They're lampstands, or they're like lampstands. It's a vision. He's looking at the churches, but he's seeing lampstands. Now, what are lampstands for? Well, obviously, they're to give off light. It's one of the primary purposes of the local church. To shine as lights in the dark communities where God has put them. A local church here, shining as a light. A local church over here, shining as a light. A local church here and here. Not just one big one, but a whole lot of local churches shining as lights in their community where God and His providence has placed them. Churches have not been placed in communities to entertain them. You know, jumping castles and big trucks and painting faces. It's not what churches are for. They just spread God's truth. 
Gospel light is designed to shine. Penetrating the darkness around as we hold up to the world, if you will, the light of the world. You're not going to see the light of the world by jumping. John describes the lampstands as golden lampstands. Now, I think the point being here is that, is that lampstands, are, they are very precious and valuable to Christ. They cost him dearly. Yes, the world might despise the local churches, true churches. So we're talking about true churches. Satan hates true churches. Your non-Christian family might treat the church lightly. Domitian, the then Roman emperor, might have be out to do all he can to squash these churches. Some professed Christians might regard true local churches carelessly, but to Jesus, to Jesus, his churches are very precious. Each one is golden to Jesus. He's the loving husband who laid down his life for such a bride. He's the good shepherd who laid down his life for these sheep. You see, to the Son of Man, the true local churches are golden to him. They're not plastic. They're golden. I think this is most encouraging. We're not going to study it, but and many of you though already know, chapters 2 and 3, of this book. They reveal to us that many of those churches were far from perfect, but still they're golden to Jesus. Isn't that helpful? You see, we might be tempted to discard true local churches because they're not all that they should be. They're not all that we might wish that they were. And, and we as a local church we are not all that we ought to be and certainly what we want to be. But Jesus regards his true churches as golden lampstands. They're given to shine his light in this dark world. And may God help us as a local church to, to see the church, the true church, true churches, as Jesus does and, and to shine, for us to shine for him in 2022, in new ways maybe, or in brighter ways than we have before. He sees two things. Firstly, he sees the golden lamp stands and the sight man moves on. The second thing that he notices is the glorified Lord. And now the vision of the Lord comes to us from verse 13 down to verse 16. And so we're just going to break this down carefully and slowly over this next uh, couple of weeks. But, but look here first at verse 13. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man. The term the Son of Man is that term, many of you know this, that Jesus most often used in his earthly ministry when he referred to himself. The term the Son of Man, at one level it may simply seem to say, well, that's about Jesus' humanity. And at one level we could argue, okay, that, that's, that's, that's a truth. But the term actually comes from the Old Testament. It comes from the book of Daniel and chapter 7. And in Daniel chapter 7, it is not the humanity of Christ that's being highlighted. It's rather the deity of Christ. The Son of Man, rather, you see, is a messianic title. John, John saw the messianic king when he turned around and he saw the seven lampstands, the golden lampstands. He also saw Messiah King. Now, what's he doing? What's the Son of Man doing in verse 13? Well, the simple description is he is in the midst of the seven lampstands. He's among the seven local churches in Asia. He, he's not distant from them. He's not disinterested in the local churches. He is there in their midst. 
And so on that Lord's Day, there is Jesus, the Son of Man, walking among his churches. He's visiting them. He's actually doing, I believe, what the Old Testament priests would do in the temple. They would come to inspect the lampstand. Uh, they would go there so that they could refresh them. They could resupply them with the oil that they needed so that those lampstands would never go out, that they would keep burning 24-7, that they would keep brightly shining as they had been designed to do. Now, do you notice what Jesus, sorry, what John saw, the glorified Son of Man, was wearing? Was he wearing? He said he was clothed with the garment down to the feet and he's girded about the chest with the golden band. This is the long flowing garment of a king or like the priests of old war. Remember, this is picture language. This is a vision. So what he sees is it's going to stand for something. And like so much in the book of Revelation, you're not going to understand it without a clear and good Old Testament understanding to be brought to bear on it. His clothings, I believe, indicate priestly dignity and royal majesty. This is the one who visits churches still. This is the great high priest. This is the great prophet. Yes, this is the glorious King Jesus in all of his royal majesty. And he is walking amidst his churches. And friends, this one visits with us. This is not just about seven churches 2,000 years ago on the other side of the planet. This is what King Jesus does. He walks among us today. I believe that truth should be more than just an idea or a conviction of a thought of a truth, but it should affect us. It should impact us. It should change us. There should be reformation if we believe this truth, I think, especially in our day. When we know that the glorified Son of Man is going to be here in ways that He is not elsewhere, as is being described by this passage, shouldn't His people want to be here if He's their Saviour and Lord? And then when we come, knowing that King Jesus is coming to inspect His lampstand, we won't be casual. We won't be late. You see, this truth ought to impact our attitude. I believe it ought to impact our singing. At this external level, it ought to impact our attire. It ought to impact our reverence. That is, if we know who this is. Let, let me just plumb it right down to practical. Parents, I just want to have a word of encouragement to you to not allow your children to come and go to the toilet or get a drink during the service here as if this is just like any other place. This is where the King of Glory is. We are in the presence of the King, the glorified Son of Man. He is in the midst of His lampstand. Oh, that, that He might allow us to sense His robe rubbing against us as He moves amongst us in this His gathering. It should impact us. And then, brethren, think He, he comes to give fresh supplies of His Spirit Spirit, isn't this precious? He comes to us to top up the oil so that we might burn for him. That light cannot burn on its own. 
The church cannot generate its own oil to do its own thing. Oh, there may be stuff going on in the flesh, but it's not this. We need the Holy Spirit to be given. These early churches in Asia, they they must have looked so vulnerable in their day. Would these lamps go out? And maybe there was fear among some of them. Is is this local church going to go out? There was so much against them. Domitian, the Roman emperor, and his pagan government were opposing them. The beast was seeking to destroy them. False teachers were already lurking around them and beginning to infiltrate them. Sin was breaking out in these churches. Coldness was beginning to grow inside of them. Would this season of persecution snuff out the church before the first century even ended? John's the last apostle alive. What's going to happen to the church when John is gone? You see, I'm sure they thought that. This is where we often can be, so human in our thinking, and caught on that plane. I mean, John's already in isolation. It's not looking good. And here is the Christ, completely acquainted with all that was unfolding in these churches. What a comfort that must have been for John. Not just to know that Jesus knew about it all. That, at one level, that is a comfort, right? Right? but also to believe that Jesus had a plan and that his plan is never thwarted because he's the king. What a comfort. John didn't need to stress himself. This was the one whom he could trust, even though life was clearly tough. My Christian friend, whatever 2022 has in store for you, this king has planned your year and he has planned it well. It will be for your good if you're one of his. And so you can trust the glorified Son of Man. Now that small Greek island, You get on the internet and just have a look for it. Have a look at the images of it. It's a picturesque place. It's a postcard destination. It's a daydream island. But what John saw was far more beautiful. His vision was far more refreshing than any Mediterranean cruise. You see, what John needed most, what those churches needed most, what we need most is a fresh glimpse of Jesus Christ as to who he is in his function and his character and his person now. And so if you're weary, if you're fearful as a Christian, this is your greatest need. No, it's not to run away. It's not to find an isolation island somewhere, which is always appealing, I get it. Our greatest need is a fresh sight of the glorified Son of Man to see what He has done for us, to see what He is doing for us. So let's look there in verse 13 and let's just have a closer look now at the clothing. That's all we're going to get to today. Here in verse 13 at His clothing. Just a closer look. One like the Son of Man, He says, clothed with a garment down to the feet. The Son of Man is wearing a priestly robe. We, we won't refer to it now, we don't have time, but in Exodus chapter 28, you could read it, it describes the priestly garments 
and it says the priestly garments are for beauty and glory. Spectacular. The high priest would make atonement for the sins of his people in these garments. He was to intercede for his people. The old covenant high priest wore a breastplate. Remember this part of your Old Testament knowledge? It's in, it's in Exodus 28. That, that, that on that breastplate, he would bear the names of the 12 tribes of Israel symbolizing that when he went into God's near presence to atone for sins, he was representing those people. He didn't go to represent the Philistines. He he didn't go to represent the Amorites, but God's covenant people. Now turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. We'll at least spend a a moment or two reading a passage in Hebrews chapter 7 as it takes up the the comparison and the, the showing us why Christ's priesthood is better than the old. So Hebrews chapter 7, let's read some verses from verse 22. He says, but so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests, because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, Christ, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For those who come to God through him. Jesus, the high priest, he always makes intercession for those for whom he had made atonement. Now, of course, Jesus didn't need to offer a sacrifice For his own sins, let's keep reading, verse 26, for for such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first, first for his own sins and then for the people's. Why? For this he did once for all, when he offered up himself. The glorified Son of Man is the very one who not just offered a sacrifice, he offered up himself. And he offered himself up for us who are his people. And now he continues to function as our great high priest. He's still wearing this long, flowing, priestly robe. It says at the end of verse 25, still in Hebrews 7, since he always lives to make intercession for them, those to whom, those very ones who are able to come to the one who saves them, they come to God Through him, they're the ones that the Father gave to the Son. So, Mum, when the pressures at home become immense, or the sense of responsibility as a man becomes overwhelming, or you need a job, Think of the one in heaven. Jesus constantly praying for you. Yes, lady, even when you're having a bad hair day, he's praying for you. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our struggles. He's fully acquainted with them all. He knows when we're discontent. And complaining. He knows our fears. Robert Murray McShane said, If I could hear Christ pleading for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. 
He is praying for us in the upper room. We need the ear of faith. He's praying for me as a believer. And so it is true what we often sing. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, I have a perfect plea. I have a great high priest whose name is love and he ever lives and he pleads for me. Come back to Revelation chapter 1 verse 13. There's another aspect, there's another item of the clothing. At the end of the verse it says, and he's girded about the chest with a golden band. I think likely again, this is a reference to the high priest who, who wore a girdle of the ephod. Again, it's in Exodus 28 and verse 8. And I just quickly, I want you to just break down these words and just see what truths there could be nestled in here. Where is this band located? What's it say? He's girded about the chest. And so this band is not around the waist. It's around the chest. It's over the heart. Isn't that precious? Jesus, the glorified Son of Man, though He is all power, though He is almighty, He is all love. The great prophet, priest and king fulfills all those offices out of deep love. He dies as the sacrifice out of love. He rises from the dead in love. He's ascended and now He's reigning in love. He's interceding for you in love. John also says, if we just really break it down carefully, he says about this what's... The girdle, sometimes it's called. He's girded about the chest. It's not stuck onto the front like the breastplate was. This is around the chest. This goes all the way around the man, as it were. What's that saying? Well, a suggestion that there is the heart of the glorified Son of Man it's always keeping him in the sacred circle of unchanging, undiminishing affection for all of those that the Father gave to him. He died for them and now he's interceding for them. He never gets weary. This never ends. It keeps going. And so when the world hates the believer... And when people reject you as a Christian and your witness, there is Jesus in glory and his love remains constant. It is an endless thing. And of course, the other obvious thing that, he, that John mentions that he saw about the girdle is that it's a golden band. Now, some commentators suggest that often the girdle was used in those, by those Eastern people to carry their money. We could go to a reference in the New Testament with the disciples where you can see this as an example that they would tuck the money in the girdle. Sort of maybe that was sort of what we would call that's where the wallet is, that's where the purse is. John sees the glorified Son of Man wearing a golden money belt. What is your need, believer? Well, Jesus can supply all your need according to his riches in glory. It's a golden band. And so Christian, Jesus has not once forgotten to plead for you before the Father's throne as you look in the rear view mirror and you think 2021 was a shocker. Jesus was praying for you through all of that. He hadn't forgotten you. He will never be quiet into the future when you and I are in need. And so as long as you have a sin to confess, Christ will be our advocate. 
As long as his people are persecuted on earth, Christ is there to represent them in heaven. Now, just remember where John is. John's not on a holiday. John's on a barren, rocky island. He's cut off from normal life. Life seems so uncertain. Life indeed seems bleak toward the future. If you just look with human eyes, but see who he has. And so whatever joy and whatever contentment that John had, it wasn't based on the circumstance or, or things going the way that he wanted them to go. He had the glorified Son of Man reigning over his life, loving him, praying for him, providing for him, and with eyes fixed on Christ, John can truly submit to whatever the providence is. John can truly trust in the midst of a situation that seems so scary and unsure, John can truly even love his enemies. He can even serve his God in the situation where God had put him in a barren, lonely, uncertain Patmos. And so, friends, I want to say at the end, come and worship him. That's what this is designed to do as we'll see in the coming weeks. That's what John does. To bow in worship. Think of this one. He who was once naked on the cross for you is now clothed in such glorious dress for you. He who humbled himself for us, he who was once despised and rejected by men is now accepted by the Father. He who was once homeless now prepares a place for us and there he pleads in glory on our behalf. You know that he would die for people like us is amazing enough, isn't it? But that he continues to function as our high priest with no millisecond break in glory staggering. And so how can you, my sinner friend who is not saved, how can you not love him? The Lord Jesus Christ, the glorified Son of God, the Father sent this one. He so loved the world that he sent this very one so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life and that he himself gave himself for sinners. Oh, that you would yield to him and embrace him as your saviour. This is the glorified son of man, not just in, in, in the day when John was on Patmos 2,000 years ago. This is the glorified son of man right this moment. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. And so, brothers and sisters, how can we not trust in him Whatever is on the 2022 road ahead and none of us know. Love him, brethren. Love him. Trust him. Listen to him. Obey him. Follow him. Serve him. May God give us the grace to do that. Let's pray. Almighty God, we bow before you, your people, so laden down with blessings in Jesus, unworthy of even a single one of them, and yet, Lord, multitude yet in store to come. Oh, gracious, gracious God, we worship you today. We honor you. We glorify you. We delight in you. We pray as we come now to, to this time that you've instituted to help us remember you and all the cost that you could be ours. We pray that you would bless us and bless this means of grace to us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.